So let's talk about AI and machine learning. There has been a lot of fuzz lately about new developments that could potentially be a breakthrough. One of those examples is GPT-3, which is a model that uses 175 billion parameters. And that's a billion with a B. It promises to solve some of the hardest machine learning problems, including task completion, answering questions, translating languages, doing arithmetics, and even generating new texts, and a lot of more interesting applications that we're going to go more deeply into. And the best part is that this is only just one model that's able to do all of that at once. So in order to really find out if this model really delivers on what it promises, we are going to take a look into the research paper, but don't worry, I will try to explain it as simply as possible. We are going to take a deeper look into the techniques and datasets used to create this model and to measure its accuracy. And we're also going to play around with the dashboard and see in real life what it actually is capable of delivering. So let's get into it. In order to better understand what GPT-3 is doing, let's take a look at its model. Unfortunately, the research paper from GPT-3 does not provide a graphical model. But what we can do is we can take a look at the model from GPT-2. If you read the documentation, you will see that they share the same model. The only difference is with the number of layers and parameters used. So let's take a look into this. First of all, we have a text and position embedded, which means that we are tokenizing our input, regularizing it a bit and feeding it to our model. As you can see, the next layer is a masked multi self attention layer. So what does that mean? It means that this input takes n number of inputs and outputs also an n number of outputs. So basically it allows the input to interact with each other. So therefore the name self attention and therefore they find out to what they should pay more attention to. So basically they assign weights to those input streams, which could be strings in this example. Then we go to a layer normalization, which is normally used to normalize the input. So this means that it could be shifting the mean and variance of the inputs. So I don't have more detail into which normalization they're using, but I guess they're using something like batch normalization. So then we have a feed forward network, which is also rather straightforward. This is a fully connected set of layers that can go only into one direction. So feed forward means that the input goes into one direction and goes out into the other direction. So it can't build circular dependencies, for example. Then we have again a layer normalization, which could be again batch normalization. And then we have our final output, which could be a text prediction or a task classifier. As you can see, they're by the only difference scaling from 12 to 24 to 96 layers. Another impressive point of GPT-3 in comparison with GPT-2 is the number of tokens used for training our model. The data includes 300 billion tokens gathered across different training sets, which we're going to take a deeper look into, which is very important for the way GPT-3 actually learns. It learns by incorporating something that's called in-context information or in-context learning, which basically means that it is looking at the context of the words it is in. And that context can vary, which varies depending on certain parameters set. It could be something from a hundred words to a few thousand words. So that would be the words that the current word that is fed in is taking into consideration when determining the next token. This maybe sounds complicated, but that's nothing else than listening to a few sentences and deciding the meaning of each of those words, taking into account the words around them. As you also can see on the graphs, basically each performance is measured using three different ways or methods. Those are zero shot, one shot and few shot, which stand in contrast with the traditional fine tuning. Traditionally, we would just fine tune the model. So basically we would train it on our general data set and afterwards we would fine tune it on a specific data set on which we wanted to make predictions in order to increase our accuracy for the context we want to apply our model for. But in the GPT-3 paper, in order to stay more general and come closer to a general 
machine learning model, they are using zero shot, one shot and few shot, which is something quite similar to fine tuning, but more general. The difference is that for example, in few shot, we typically present the model with a few dozen examples before creating the final prediction on the data we want to predict. Whereas in one shot, we show it one example and in zero shot, as you already guessed, we don't show them any example, we just require it to make a prediction. And as we will later see, we will have the results for each of those methods. Of course, few shot uh, always being a bit better than one shot and also than zero shot, but they come pretty close to each other, which is quite impressive. Another very impressive part of GPT-3 is the sheer size of the training data. As we have already mentioned, it includes over 300 billion tokens. The training data, in fact, is so large that we are never going to be updating on the same sequence twice. As you can see, the data stems from Common Crawl, WebText 2, Books 1, 2, and Wikipedia, with Wikipedia being just weighted at 3% into the total data set and common crawl contributing to more than 60%. And common crawl is also the only data set that is filtered and not used in its pure and original quality. According to the paper, the performance of GPT-3 was slightly increased when filtering the common crawl data set. There are also many versions of GPT-3, with GPT-3 being the final model with the most parameters. And the more parameters we have, the less data we are actually using for training it. Otherwise, if we were to linearly increase the amount of training data with the number of parameters, our computational expenses would basically explode. And this graph shows us the total compute using training with training petaflops per S days. And if you're wondering which equipment was used for this, it were V100 GPUs. So maybe a small hint on which equipment you should use if you want to train your own models at home. So let's get to the most interesting part, looking at the results. We are going to take a look into the paper and compare how GPT-3 compares when faced with different tasks, stuff like task completion, answering questions, language translation, arithmetic, writing text, and so on. And we're also going to see GPT-3 in action, actually performing what it's promising to do. As we already mentioned in the video, there are a few parameters. First of all, we are measuring the results with increasing the parameters with GPT-3, with GPT-3 being the largest one with 175 billion parameters. And we're also going to compare the results using zero shot, one shot and few shot. It is quite remarkable with the increase of parameters, number of parameters, the performance and accuracy increases dramatically. Taking a look here, for example, at task completion, the accuracy increases to over 70% and even above 70% when using fine tuning with few shots. If you take a look at translation, for example, we can translate from French to English, English to French, German to English, Romanian to English, and so on. And the accuracy is better with certain languages than with others. This is most probably due to the number of data set and the data sets used for this. But as you can see, the performance also increases dramatically with the performance hovering around 40% for 175 billion parameters. When doing QA tasks, so questions and answering, the accuracy also increases dramatically, even coming close to something like 90%. It is still not on human level, but it is getting there. And with fine tuning, it is increasing even more. But as you can see, increasing from 13 to 175 billion parameters doesn't increase the accuracy that dramatically. But even with 0.1 billion parameters, it is well above random guessing. Arithmetic is also an extremely interesting part here. So if we do something like digit addition, subtraction, multiplication, and so on, you can see that the accuracy increases dramatically, even reaching 100% with 175 billion parameters. Hovering pretty low until the 6.7, 13 billion parameter mark and then increasing basically exponentially when coming to the levels of GPT-3. With some performance being quite low with, for example, five digit addition, but with two and three, it's basically close to 100 or even reaching 100% accuracy. As you can see in this example, we want to translate to French, Spanish and Japanese. 
you just give it a sentence and it is going to translate it automatically. This is just incredible. And when you also take into consideration how natural we gave it the task, we didn't have to specify a checkbox or, or anything that you would expect in normal software. We just wrote it like you would have said it to a human. Please, could you translate this to the following languages? And indeed, it did translate the text without any problems. If you, for example, try to give it some questions, it is also remarkable how fast GPT-3 is able to give us a response. Indeed, it works better if you provide some standard questions, something like you would ask on Wikipedia. It gets quite a few unknowns if we ask um, strange or questions that require a lot of context. But this is still really fascinating to see this in action. And also remember, there was no fine tuning done to this model. We can even try something like translating programming languages. So in this case, we want to translate a simple JavaScript to Python, a small code block. And as you can see, this is fascinating. We even managed to create the for loops. Um, it got one indentation wrong here for Python but this is still fine. And you will also see a lot of examples of GPT-3 actually translating and creating code blocks. And one reason this works so well is because of the data used. Uh, GitHub is quite easily accessible and scrapable. So there is a lot of code that went into the training. And you can of course fine tune it yourself to make it work really well with certain programming languages. You can even ask it to generate you an outline for a text so for example, in this case, we want to have an outline for an essay to write, and it is going to give us some bullet points into what we should include in that essay. There are also a lot of similar implementations for just generating text that could be useful for something like generating blog posts or content ideas, or just maybe using it as outlines for a bigger project as we did in this example. And as you can see, there is a vast number of examples from anything translating languages, code, generating text, chatting, Q&As, answering questions, interview questions, generating business ideas, classifying tweets, even classifying tweets into colors, extracting contact information, writing code, and so on and so forth. And there is no lack of creativity into creating more and more interesting products that are based on GPT-3. So I hope you really like this small and short overview of GPT-3. As you can see, only the sky is the limit and there are going to come more and more models which are capable of even doing more than this. But if you'd like me to cover maybe some specific topic like creating an app based on GPT-3 and incorporating something cool like um, maybe answering um, SQL interview questions or something like that, please let me know down below in the comments. So I hope you enjoyed the video and you learned a lot and see you in the next one.